Lord is good, and He's worthy of our praise. Amen? Amen. If you have a Bible this morning, I want to invite you to turn with me to John chapter 4. John chapter 4 is where we're going to be uh, this morning, and um, I want to take a few minutes today and not talk about spiritual the spiritual battle that we're in. Uh, if you haven't been here the last few weeks, we've been talking about understanding that we are all in a spiritual battle. And last week we looked at Paul's letter to Timothy, his last letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy, where he encouraged his young protege to fight the good fight of faith. And he talked about the farmer, the soldier, and does anyone remember the third one? The athlete. Correct. And he talked about not uh, involving yourself in the affairs of this world, which was an interesting verse by itself. Um, and then a couple weeks ago, we, we talked about the danger of having divided loyalty between the, the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God. That was one of the other things we looked at. Uh, we also talked about having a humble heart. God resists the proud, but gives grace to what? The humble. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So um, this morning, I want to deviate from that theme of the spiritual battle that we're in and talk a little bit about letting your light shine. Letting your light shine. How many of you remember that song from Sunday school, This Little Light of Mine, I'm going to let it shine. And then do you remember the other thing, put it under a bushel, and then all the kids loved to yell, ow, really loud, and the Sunday school teachers were like, I'm getting too old for this, right? And in the, 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 the point of the song is that you and I are called to shine the light of Jesus in a dark world. And sometimes I think we really have to be careful that we don't fall into the trap of what the news wants you to think and what politicians want you to think, and that is that the darkness is winning and will win. And so coupled with that means that we can't shrink back. We have to be salt and light in our world. We have to shine the light. Um, I love living in a small town. Um, there's a lot of controversy right now about a country music song. Maybe you saw the news about living in a small town. But I love living in a small town. I w when I first came to New Prague, I came from, we came from Prior Lake. And New Prague was about to be the smallest town I ever lived in in my life. Even back to the one I grew up in, Grays Lake, Illinois. Um, and I thought, oh, dear Lord, how are we going to make it in a small town? They don't have a caribou. <laughs> they don't have a Starbucks. The Walmart's really far, right? We started going through those, those lists of things. And now, after being here for 17 years, I would go to the mountains of Montana in a New York minute. You better believe it. Amen. I got one amen. But, but here's the thing. We have to be very careful because there's a temptation to disengage from the world around us. There's a temptation to want to just build a cocoon to insulate ourselves and isolate ourselves from the world. I don't know how many of you are uh, the Lord of the Rings or the Fellowship of the Rings fans or the Hobbit, um, but the whole line in there where the wizard shows up and invites this little hobbit to go on an adventure. And what does he say? He says, adventures are nasty, dirty things, and they'll make you late for dinner. <laughs> and it's because the Shire had been a place that he had grown very comfortable in. And the idea of the bad guy being in this faraway land, what concern of that was, was that to him, and what he found out the hard way was that whether he chose to go out and engage the darkness or he waited, the darkness was coming. 
And that was the reality, that the darkness was coming. But, don't say amen yet. You haven't heard everything I have to say. (laughs) But the real question is, so how do we engage in that way? Because I'm here to tell you this morning as a pastor, there are a lot of, of Christians and either other pastors who are doing this very poorly, in my opinion. And so any time that we come up against this challenge, we have to go back to God's Word. So look at John chapter 4. Maybe you know it, maybe you don't, maybe you just need a refresher. But Jesus is in a place where he shouldn't be, according to the Jews. And Jesus is in a place where he's interacting with a woman that he should not be interacting with, according to the Jews. John chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually he came, now here's the thing, if you research this, he didn't have to. He could have gone around. But he chose to. He chose to go through Samaria. Eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired from the walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. Verse 9, the woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. So make a mental note of that. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, if only you knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, who would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would we get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Verse 13, Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again, but those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water, then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you are right, you don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you are living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Verse 19, sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. And so then she goes on and goes into a different theme of the chapter we're not going to cover today. But what I want to talk to you about this morning again is, what are the lessons that we can learn from Jesus' interaction in John chapter 4. Lord, help us over the next few minutes to hear what you have to say to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor John MacArthur said this, you are the only Bible some unbelievers will ever read, and your life is under scrutiny every day. What do others learn from you? Do they see an accurate picture of God? It's an interesting uh, thought to consider. Um, If you're like me, you kind of cringe at the idea of evangelism. You say, you're a pastor and you're saying that you cringe at the idea of evangelism. Well, maybe a better way to say it, Chaplain Michael, is I cringe at some people's ideas of evangelism. That's a little different. (laughs) Sharing our faith can certainly seem intimidating, but sometimes we have to acknowledge that our biggest hurdle is our own concern for how people perceive us. Sometimes our biggest concern with sharing our faith is what will that other person 
think if I start talking about my faith in the context of not being in a church building. And yet Jesus, in John chapter 4, the Bible says, he went through a place that most Jews didn't go to. He interacted with someone that most Jews wouldn't interact with. And ironically, nobody taught him the four spiritual laws because he never brought them up. <laughs> Uh-oh. Right? He did it. He didn't bring up the four spiritual laws. Anyone that you want to put on that. He simply engaged with this woman and had a conversation with her. Here's what I think we need to think of first. This is not a point, but you might want to write it down is in order to have the right heart for people, we have to have God's heart. You can't have a, a religious heart that says, well, this is my duty to get into heaven to do evangelism, right? Or this is my duty because I'm a Christian. You have to have God's heart for people. And you will not get God's heart for people if you don't pray for them. Your primary calling when it comes to letting your light shine is to, to speak to God on behalf of those people. Because you don't know if anyone else is, right? And so maybe you have a coworker, maybe you have a family member, maybe you have a neighbor, and you say, this person really needs God. Now, maybe you say that because, I don't know, you don't like the way they mow their lawn. I don't know. Um, but, but you have a perception, right? You have a perception that this person does not know the Lord and they need to. You can start by praying for them. But here's the other interesting thing that I'm learning as I get older, and that is this. People are far more open to hearing what we have to say than we think they are. Now, don't misunderstand me. I understand that there can be situations and people that you talk to and they say, don't talk to me about religion. I get, I get all of that. But what I'm beginning to find is that because people are no longer attending church, and many of them are no longer attending church because they view it as something of their family tradition that goes back generations and it has no relevance in their life today, they're still looking and they're still lost to try to make sense of the big things of life. Death, suffering, pain, the afterlife, all of those sorts of things. So just quitting church does not help you answer those questions, correct? Add to that somebody who struggles with addiction or someone who's going through a relationship struggle, whatever it may be. There are still a sense that people have of, look, there has to be more to life than what I'm living. One of the th themes, if you ever watch a movie, sometimes you'll see it. It was, it was most obvious in the movie The Groundhog Day. Everybody see The Groundhog Day? Where the thing keeps happening over and over. But there's been many spin-offs of movies uh, since then that highlight and show you the redundancy that people have in their lives. That's a story we can all relate to. We get up on Monday, we go to work. We get up on Tuesday, we go to work. We get up on Wednesday, we go to work. We Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we mow the lawn. Sunday, maybe we go to church. Monday, it starts all over again. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. And it's like you're on this hamster wheel. We can all identify with that. Well, guess what else we can identify with? There has to be more to life than this, than punching a clock and mowing my lawn and maybe going to church or, you know, hoping my uh, football team the Vikings go to the Super Bowl. Let's just be honest. It's never going to happen. <laughs> Those days are over. And it's the same for the Bears. I'll, I'll say the same thing. We're, the Bears and the Vikings are never going to win a Super Bowl in your lifetime. One of the th most impactful stories for me, I don't know about for Jody, but for me was one time, and I've told this story before, but we went out to eat at a Olive Garden. Someone had got us a gift card, I think, and we went out to eat at the Burnsville Olive Garden, and we sat down and, you know, um, said, where's our breadsticks? No. <laughs> um, sat down and waited patiently for our breadsticks. And the table next to us uh, had a few different people in it, and, uh, including a woman who came, who's uh, it was obvious that English was not her first language. And over the course of our meal, we got to eavesdrop 
on this table talking about the Bible. And this woman was just incredibly curious, just asking question after question after question. It was so much different than what she had grown up with or even ever heard. And that was one of the most impactful moments of my life when it comes to thinking about this whole topic because what I realized is too often I just assume that people don't want to hear what I have to say. And I'm realizing many times I'm probably wrong. Many times the people that I'm potentially interacting with are very open to hearing what I have to say. So if you're taking notes, let's just acknowledge a few things from the text today to consider. First, notice that Jesus wasn't at the temple or church. Jesus was not at the temple. Jesus didn't have a worship band before he talked to her, right? I hope they have a good worship set today before I talk to this woman. Maybe he had like a snowmobile trailer with a mini band that he pulled by a donkey, right? He didn't have that. Not only that, he didn't have air conditioning. There was no beautiful building and comfy seats and Coffee and donuts. How is this person ever going to come to the Lord? We need to face a very harsh truth. And that is that sometimes people outside the church are more open than people inside the church. Look at Luke chapter 14. If you don't believe me, let's look at Luke chapter 14, verse 23. <clears throat> Or actually, go back to verse 16 of Luke chapter 14. It says this. A man, he's, Jesus is telling a story. It says, A man prepared a great feast and sent out many invitations. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servant to tell the guests, Come, the banquet is ready. But they all began to make excuses. One said, I have just bought a field and must inspect it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five pairs of oxen and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. And another said, I now have a wife, so I can't come. Boy, I'd like to know more about that. <laughs> I mean, I get it at face value, right? Verse 21, the servant returned and told his master what they had said. His master was furious and said, go quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. After the servant had done this, he reported, there is still more room. So his master said, go into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come so that my house will be filled. For none of those I first invited will get even the smallest taste of my banquet. Well, this is my personal ask to you as your pastor. Don't limit your idea of letting your light shine to counting on someone so showing up at church on Sunday and sitting next to you and you talking to them. Because it's a high, there's a high probability if you've been to church more than three times, it's not going to happen. Right? We have to go out the whole point of the gospel, the whole point of what Jesus taught was what? Go. Go. I believe it, uh, someone once said, we, as a church, we should just uh, judge our success by our sending capacity, not our seating capacity. We should judge our success by how well each of us individually throughout the week go out into the community, into our homes, into our jobs, into our workplaces, wherever you go between Sundays, as being a missionary. You say, I'm not a missionary. I'm not a missionary. I'm not a missionary. I live in New Prague. <laughs> Guess what? Bad news. You are a missionary. And Paul said not only that, but Paul used the language of ambassador. You are an ambassador for the kingdom of God. You know, sometimes, um, you know, I, oh, I was a bartender and I exchanged the bar for this, a wooden bar for this. 
And sometimes I miss the, the bar. Because people would show up and belly up and belly ache. Let's be honest. <laughs> but you had an open opportunity to talk to them. Because they would unload and share what their week or month or year was going like. And it was uh, very therapeutic for them. By the way, I don't recommend this because uh, you never know who the bartender is you're going to get. And it could be really bad advice. <laughs> Second, notice that Jesus engaged her first in a natural way. Uh, I said this earlier, but I'll say it again. I've done multiple evangelism trainings over the years. And some of them have been a great way to get the conversation going. But I've learned that you have to meet people where they are at. Let me say that again. You have to meet people where they are at. People don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. And one of the things that it's, we have to remind ourselves is it's not our job to convince them. It's our job to testify. You ever watch the, one of those, anybody else like those uh, lawyer shows or maybe you walk, watch one of those docuseries, you know, about a trial and um, there's a big one happening right now in Florida. No, New York on the East Coast, Long Island. Uh, a serial killer, and people are enamored by all of that. Well, if you ever watch a, a TV show or a drama or anything that has the ability for you to witness a witness, ah, see what I did there? All they do is they just testify to what they saw and they heard. And, and some of them go, look, I'm just telling you, this is what I saw. And this is what I heard. Now, through cross-examination, you know, they try and, you know, get them all confused and all that sort of stuff. In many ways, that's no different than you and I sharing our faith. We can plant the seed, but it's the Holy Spirit that brings the fruit. Let me say that again. We plant the seed, but it's the Holy Spirit that brings the fruit. They've done research now, and they say that the average person has to be exposed to the gospel, I think it's like 18 times before they believe. So you might just be one of 18 people, but you still can do your part to testify to what you've seen. Um, so we have to remember that our job is to be a witness. It's like that evangelist said. Evangelism is just one beggar telling another beggar where to go and get bread. Our job is just to say, we've been where you're at. Let me tell you where you can go. I can give anyone directions that asks, but it doesn't mean that they're going to listen. Right? Look at John chapter 9. John chapter 9. This is another... Um, story, and it's a story about Jesus healing a blind man, and the Pharisees were upset about it, and in verse 17, they said to the man, the Pharisees again questioned the man who had been blind and demanded, what's your opinion about this man who healed you, meaning Jesus? The man replied, I think he must be a prophet. So this guy is obviously trying to figure out and learn who Jesus is, right? Verse 18, the Jewish leaders still refused to believe the man. The man had been blind and could now see, so they called in his parents. They asked him, is this your son? Was he born blind? If so, how can he now see? <laughs> it's almost comical, right? Verse 20, his parents replied, we know this, we know this, testifying, our son, this is our son, and that he was born blind, but we don't know how he can see or who healed him. Ask him. He's old enough to speak for himself. Verse 22, his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who announced that anyone saying Jesus was the Messiah 
would be expelled from the synagogue. synagogue. That's why they said, he is old enough, ask him. Verse 24, so the second time they called in the man who had been blind and told him, God should get the glory for this because we know that this man, Jesus, is a sinner. Verse 25, this is how a witness speaks. I don't know whether he's a sinner, the man replied, but I know this. I was blind and now I can see. Verse 26, but what did he do, they asked. How did he heal you? Verse 27, look, exclamation point, the man exclaimed. I told you once. Didn't you listen? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Gets a little sarcastic with him. <laughs> then they cursed him and said, you are his disciples, but we are disciples of Moses. So the man gets, he gets frustrated. He says, look, I told you what happened. But obviously, you don't believe me, or you don't want to believe me, or you don't want to hear me. But this is what I will tell you. Once I was blind, and now I see. And he left it up to them to decide who Jesus was. Whether or not he was a sinner, whether or not he was the Son of God, as he proclaimed. He just testified with what he saw. You know, when I started to realize this, it took a big weight off of me. Because all I realized I had to do was tell my story. Right? This is who I was before I put my faith in Christ, and this is who I was after. And this is what I've seen since doing that. This is how faithful in the Lord has been in all the things in my life and how good he has been. But I don't have to convince you of anything. Which leads to finally notice that Jesus did end up getting down to truth. He spoke the truth. Now here's the thing. When you read scripture, we don't know the tone of the text. Amen? So if you're just reading verses in the Bible, you're reading your Bible, you don't know the tone that Jesus took with this woman. But obviously he got down to uh, details with her about her personal life that only he could know, which was very impactful to her. Because she said, well, I don't have a husband. He said, you're right, you don't. You have five, and the one you're with now is not your husband. And so he spoke the truth to her, and that reality flipped the switch in her heart. Something happened, because then she realized, who is this person? Who is this person? How do they know this about me? So as we close this morning, what I want us to do for just a minute or two is I want to spend a minute or two and talk about probably the number one problem in our country today, and how you and I can approach that number one problem differently, okay? So there is an agenda today to divide America. Who's doing it? I don't know. But division is the goal. Ultimately, we know that it's Satan, right? He wants to bring division. He wants people on separate sides. He wants them... Uh, not able to get along with each other. So it presents a challenge. And the challenge by some people is that we just have to accept and affirm everybody, which they don't really believe anyways because eventually there's somebody they can't accept or they can't affirm, correct? So you're back to the, the problem of division, so the accept and affirm crowd has a dilemma because they don't really practice what they preach. The other problem is those who feel that if somebody thinks differently than me, we can't be neighbors, right? We can't be friends. We can't go to church. We can't have family gatherings. That's the division winning. And so the question is, what do we do about it? Well, we better understand and, and know our history and understand that part of what has made our country great is rigid debate. 
There's an idea today that debate is bad. That's not true. Debate is very good. We need to flesh out ideas. We need to challenge the status quo. We need to challenge worldviews. We need to challenge all of these things. But, and here's the, the big but for us as Christians, we have to understand that it has to be done with kindness, humility, and respect. Let me just say that again. We have to re remember that it can be done with kindness, humility, and respect. Look at Colossians chapter 4. One more verse uh, before we close. Turn over to Colossians chapter 4. I, I find it interesting that Paul spoke to believers about how they interact with those outside. I'm not going to go there today because we're out of, out, already out of time. But in the book of Corinthians, Paul says straight up, he, he says, it is not my job to judge those outside the church. Paul's very clear about that, right? He's talking about, actually, he's talking about sexual immorality. And we know right now that sexual immorality in our culture is rampant. And so we have to be very careful because the temptation is to fight fire with fire. But Paul himself, and again, I'm not starting a new sermon, but I just want to remind you, Paul himself said, it is not my job to judge those outside of the church. But what he did say is expel, think about this, the sexual immoral person from within the church so that that they can be uh, brought back to restoration. So we need that clear distinction in our minds. It is not our job to judge those outside the church. We've got enough of a mess inside the church. <laughs> but then he also says in Colossians, Colossians chapter 4, verse 5, he says this. He's very specific about dealing with outsiders. He says, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Verse 6, let your conversation be gracious and attractive. This is the New Living Translation. So that you will have the right response for everyone. And so let me just say, this should never happen on social media. Because it, social media is like the Bible. It's tone deaf. We don't know how people hear words, right? We don't know the tone that they take. But if you are going to engage with people, and, and again, I'm wrestling this with, with this personally. Um, just people who don't believe what I believe, people who don't think what I think. My first job, let me remind you of what I said at the beginning, is to love them and pray for them. Right? And that may be all the Lord ever asks me to do, is to love them and pray for them. Now, should the opportunity arise, and should the chance come for me to then speak on behalf of, of the Lord and speak on behalf of the kingdom, then I know my job is to testify as to what I have seen and heard, just like a witness. Now, that comes natural to me when I get into that situation. And here's the, here's the reason why. I ask myself very hard questions about what I believe. There, sh there should be nothing inappropriate inside the church for asking hard questions. Right? We should all be open and not scared by hard questions. But what I will tell you is that when I ask myself the hard questions, I now know that I'm better equipped to answer other people's hard questions. Right? I'll give you a very simple example. Some people love to say, why do bad things happen to good people? To which I now say, why do good things happen to bad people? If the logic is good people shouldn't have bad things, then it would be equally true that good people 
or excuse me, bad people shouldn't have good things, right? If you took that line of thinking. Now, I understand it's a very complex issue. I'm not making light of the issue. It is very complex. There's a mystery to it. Jesus said the rain falls on the just and the unjust, right? But it's a way to engage in the conversation that shows I've actually thought about it. I've actually wrestled with it myself. And this is the problem I have with the question. Did you know that sometimes there's just bad questions? <laughs> right? <laughs> I ask them all the time, why can't I dunk? <laughs> yeah, Tom said coffee, a donut and a coffee. There, there, are some, there are some people who ask impossible questions f- to have a gotcha moment, and they're not acknowledging the fact that they, too, live in a mystery. There's a lot of things that none of us understand about this life. But that is the beauty of having a relationship with God. God knows what I don't. He makes up for the the wisdom, the knowledge, and all of the things that I lack. Right? And so I can say, I'm not sure about that. And so, because I'm not sure about that difficult question, what I revert back to is God is good, God is faithful, and He's trustworthy. And so for some reason, God doesn't think I need to know this. But now you really start to, you know, really mess with people. Not because you're trying to, but it's because of how you shape and view the world. And so I just want to leave us with Colossians 4, 5, and 6. Live wisely among those who are not believers. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Going back to the beginning, I want to ask this question. How are you letting your light shine? How are you engaging with people outside the church? And no, I don't mean posting a scripture verse on Facebook. (laughs) I mean building a relationship, building a bridge to unbelievers building a bridge to them. I'll tell you what I thought about today. I'm ready. (laughs) Jody, sometimes we have to run into town on Sunday mornings before church. We have to get something. We have to do something, whatever. And I'll tell you, you want to talk about hard questions, okay? This is the way my brain works when I go out in public and I observe, okay? So we went out and we ran to one of the grocery stores that has a liquor store this morning. And at 10, 1030 in the morning, I observed people going into the liquor store on a Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. The way that my brain works is, why? Could it be that they understand what I talked about earlier that many movie creators understand, and that is life just doesn't seem worth it. And so in order to take the pain off of the redundancy and the complacency and the problems of my life, I find consolation in a bottle. Uh, Probably. I don't know about the particular people I saw today, but I think we could all agree that probably happens. Correct? So I observe that. And I say, buddy, you're not going to find it there. You're not going to find it there. I see more opportunity the more I pray for God to give me his heart. And it seems like maybe it's not that I'm seeing more opportunity, but I'm seeing things from his perspective more than my own. 
And ironically, not only am I seeing more opportunity, unbelievably, it seems like more opportunity is coming my way. Again, is it because I'm praying more? Or is it because of what I'm praying and saying, God, put me in a place where I can let my light shine? Is it scary? Sure. It's really scary. When we were, I, you know me, I hate flying. I'm a nervous Nelly on a plane, right? We were flying home in March, in April, Taylor and I, and Taylor was by the window. I was in the middle, a young man, probably in his late 20s. And this guy was demonstrating how I felt internally. <laughs> I mean, like, to the point, like, I asked him point blank. I'm like, dude, you must be nervous to fly. And he's like, oh, no, oh, no, I'm, I'm good. And I'm like, then you're high on something. Because, I mean, he was like, he had his headphones on. He had his head down. He was doing this. I mean, just wouldn't even look up. And I thought, no, bro, it's, you're, you're going to be okay. You know what I mean? And I had to, got to have a conversation to him. Did I lead it, you know, did I go through the sinner's prayer and lead him to the Lord? No. But eventually I gave, engaged in a conversation that you can have in a short two and a half hour flight. You see, the pressure is taken off of me if I know that I'm just planting one seed or I'm watering. Paul said one plants, another waters, but God brings the harvest. God brings the increase. Am I planting? Am I watering? They're kind of the same thing. That's all I got to do. And then pray. And so... What I, the reason I wanted to share this message today is I just wanted us to consider and be reminded again what John MacArthur said. You are the only Bible some unbelievers will ever read. And what do they see when they read? Lord, thank you for this uh, opportunity we've had to gather together today in your name. Lord, thank you that your spirit is at work even this morning in each of our lives. Lord, help us to get into rhythm with what you are doing in this season of our lives. Help us to pray and to search the scriptures and to look to you and say, Lord, we are here to do your purpose. We are here to be your ambassadors. We are here to be a witness to what we have seen. And help us to be, as Chaplain Michael said, faith is hearing and obeying. And we pray you would help us to do just that as we interact with the world around us. We thank you and we praise you today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. The Lord bless you as you go this morning. If you need prayer, we have some people here in the altar. Be happy to pray with you, but otherwise we'll see you next Sunday. God bless.